time to break in a new page in your Bible. You've, uh, you've worn out First and Second Thessalonians, and uh, I know that uh, the, the Bible tends to, to hold on to those, those, those places that you're in a lot, and so we're going to go all the way back. The good news is, is this where we're at today and for a while is going to help your Bible uh, because it's right in the middle. So, so that spine's going to wear out right in the middle, and the Bible's going to fold open nicely. It's going to be good for you. It's good for us. So we are all the way back in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. And contrary to popular belief, Jeremiah was more than just a bullfrog. Uh, I, was gonna fi- I was trying to find some cute little video to show, and, and uh, you know, that song, of course, you can't think about Jeremiah and not have that song in your head, but that song gets into to wine and carousing really quick in, in the song, and, and the video I found that, that really got my attention, it was, uh, I don't know, y'all remember the... the kind of how churches used to do the, the music videos where they would act out the motions to a worship song or something like that, the, the living video type thing. Well, I found a, a, a senior home, a rest home, that did a living video to Three Dogs Night, Joy to the World. And I thought, well, what are they doing in the rest home with this song? And so I started watching, and, and I mean, it is what you can imagine, the, the folks in their wheelchairs and various states of memory care and things like that. What I just cracked up laughing it wasn't appropriate to show you all but you know where YouTube is and it was the part where the bullfrog is talking about his wine and it got to all the old folks in the rest home and man they all had a big old glass of wine sitting around in the in the room there and I thought well at least they slept well in the nursing home that night uh so <laughs> feel free to go look it up um however Before Jeremiah ever made his way into the canon of rock and roll as a friendly bullfrog sommelier, he was an Old Testament prophet. Now, if you ever heard that song and wonder what it was about, maybe you tried to spiritualize the opening lyrics to that song. Some have suggested even that this particular song, Joy to the World, that it represented God's desire to unite all people in happiness saying that the bullfrog with his distinctive call stands out in nature and it is God's voice speaking to all mankind to unite them together in happiness and joy. In reality, the songwriter Hoyt Axton told a different story. With the chorus and melody already written, he added some placeholder lyrics where he intended to write proper verses. And what came out of his mouth in that time was that famous first line. Axton said, Jeremiah was an expedient of the time. He said, I had the chorus for three months, took a drink of wine, leaned on the speaker and said, Jeremiah was a bullfrog. It was meaningless. It was a temporary lyric. Before I could rewrite it, they cut it and it was a hit. So it was that these nonsense placeholder lyrics became a place in rock and roll history. Now, religious interpretations rarely take into account that Mr. Axton was more of a rabble rouser than a student of the Bible. He was a heavy drinker, a pot smoker, with a passion for fast cars, women, and motorcycles. By the time he wrote the song Joy to the World, he was twice divorced with hundreds of speeding tickets on his record. Might have done him some good to actually read the book of Jeremiah. You know, we tend to shy away from substantive studies in the major prophetic books of the Old Testament. I know if you do an annual Bible reading plan, there are certain places that you get to and you, I know that feeling. Like Leviticus is that, like I, I, I just got to get through it. If I can get through Leviticus, there's, you know, there's something coming that, that I can get through. And then, man, those prophetic books can wear us out too because they're long. They're, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of words. And, and, and honestly, they can be really hard to read. Their length can be very intimidating too. In particular, Jeremiah, it is the longest book in the Bible with 30,000 Hebrew words. That's 3,000 more words than the book of Psalms has. And so, I know some of you are like, oh no. He just said he's preaching through the longest book of the Bible. Don't worry, don't worry, we, we'll, we'll get through it, don't worry. And, and the context of the prophetic works can be easily lost. Like, who are they talking to again? When did this happen? Because I know it's hard to even keep track of the kings when you're trying to keep track of Israel's history and you're reading your Old Testament and you got Israel and you got Judah and you got this king doing that king and this king messing around and doing this and this king doing that and somebody's being conquered and it's hard to keep it all straight. I mean, you almost need a chart to, to sort of map it all out. And so it's hard. And we know some of the key verses that preachers like to use to illustrate 
in more familiar sermons on New, uh, New Testament texts. We know, Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. You know, the high school graduates are going to get the, the, in, the inevitable Christmas or graduation card that says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for a hope and a future, even though that is the most out-of-context verse in all the Bible. Don't send that to your high school graduates. It's a terrible message to send to your high school graduates. If you see that card, shriek and move away from it because it's a butchering of the Word of God. Do not use that, that passage. So a deep dive into Jeremiah can be overwhelming, but we're going to get through it together. In spite of these things, you cannot read through this book and not get a sense that the words of the prophet are still somehow incredibly relevant to us today. They were written over 600 years before the birth of Jesus. The words of Jeremiah were, were directed at kings and kingdoms that have long passed away, but there's something about his words that still speak with clarity and conviction to a world that has lost its way. Jeremiah wrote during a time of incredible national upheaval. Every aspect of his nation, everything that he knew was coming apart. There was great moral upheaval. Politically, there was turmoil. Suffering was unimaginable. Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations. Don't read Lamentations if you're feeling bad about your life, because Lamentations is not a good read if you're having some struggles. Don't read Lamentations if you're not, if you're not feeling good about things. And the church, at least the Old Testament Jewish equivalent, was complicit, even providing some of Jeremiah's biggest opponents. So obviously, there's a lot of distinctives between 7th century B.C. in Israel and the United States in the 21st century A.D. But the good student of the Bible is always looking for bridges between now and then, and Jeremiah just happens to be full of those bridges. Kathleen Norris said a prophet's task is to reveal the fault lines hidden beneath the comfortable surface of the worlds we invent for ourselves. The national myths as well as the little lies and delusions of control and security that get us through the day. And Jeremiah does this better than anyone. Reflecting on the societal upheaval of the 1960s, Francis Schaeffer said, Jeremiah provides us with an extended study of an era like our own, where men have turned away from God and society has become post-Christian. I've always wondered what Schaeffer would say if he could look into 2023 America, if that's what he said about the 1960s. It may be that these ancient words in Jeremiah have more to say about our own day and time than we've even been willing to acknowledge. So today, let's turn our attention to the opening book, the opening verses of the book of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to tackle the first 10 verses today. If you've got your place, you found the book, it's a big one in the middle. Let's stand up and as we read these words from Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning there in verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 30, 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem, in the fifth month. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a youth for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And the Lord put out his hand, touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build, and to plant. Father, thank you for the words to the prophet, for his call and for his commission Thank you for an Old Testament book that has much to say about our modern day and is a powerful critique of the world in which we live. May we be faithful uh, in handling your word today, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. 
you've heard of Jeremiah and you've probably known him as the weeping prophet because he, he cried tears of sadness, not only because he knew what was about to happen in the history of Israel, but because no matter how hard he tried, the people would not listen. When Michelangelo painted him on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he presented Jeremiah in a posture of despair. He looks like a man who has wept so long that he has no tears left to shed. His face is turned to one side like a man who's been battered by many blows. His shoulders are hunched forward, weighed down by the sins of the nation. His eyes are also cast down, as if he can no longer bear to see God's people suffer. His hand covers his mouth. Perhaps he has nothing left to say. A weeping prophet, a man who cried because he grieved for the sins of his people, but he grieved for what the outcome of those sins were going to be. Furthermore, he had no human comfort. If you read through the book, you'll learn that God had forbidden Jeremiah from marrying or having children. You find that in the 16th chapter of the book. His friends, what few he had, turned their backs on him. It seems that if you stand for righteousness in a godless world, that there aren't many people who are willing to befriend you. Obviously, the people of Israel, Judah, had become so hardened by the numbing effects of sin that they no longer believed God, nor did they really even fear him. And the opening verses of the book remind us, to top it all off, that Jeremiah is what we call a PK. He's a priest kid. I don't know if that's anything like being a preacher's kid, but I know that it can be a challenging place to grow up. Jeremiah preached for 40 years, and not once did he see any real success in changing the people or softening the hearts and minds of the stubborn, idolatrous people. He never really saw any meaningful fruit in the course of his ministry. But one of the reasons Jeremiah is so compelling to contemporary audiences today is because the church probably feels very much the same way. We preach and we preach, but we don't see things change the way we want. In fact, there are more times than not that it almost feels like we're fighting a losing battle. But then we see videos like we saw at the beginning of our worship service today of high school and middle school students gathering before their school flagpoles to, to pray together. Uh, to pray for their schools and to pray for their teachers and to pray for their peers. And so even when we feel defeated, God is good to give us a reminder that, uh, that he is still king and he is still on his throne. But it might still do us some good to be heartbroken like Jeremiah was over the depravity of our own communities and certainly the, the depravity of our own nation. The book of Jeremiah contains the words of Jeremiah, but these words were probably brought together by a few of his loyal disciples. One is mentioned throughout the book, his name is Baruch, and he's probably the one who compiled the sermons of Jeremiah. Jeremiah didn't sit down and write this out like Paul would have sat down and, and wrote a letter. And so this is a, a record of Jeremiah's prophetic ministry. His sermons, his oracles, they were recorded and compiled and given to us in the book that we have today. In fact, one of the darkest moments in the whole book is in chapter 36. We find out what happens. You can read it if you want. King Jehoiakim actually takes a large portion of Jeremiah's prophetic ministry that's recorded on a scroll. Baruch is, is reading it to him. And Jehoiakim actually takes Jeremiah's words, cuts them off the scroll a strip at a time, and throws them in a fire and burns them. And again, you say, well, well, man, if somebody burned Jeremiah out of my Bible, I'd just go get a new Bible. You're right, you would. But if you were Jeremiah the prophet, that scroll was the only written record of your whole ministry. And the king burned those words. But I love the fact that God tells him, get another scroll, write it all over again. And that's exactly what Jeremiah does. God is faithful to his word spoken through the prophet, even when no, the, the king has no regard for the words that are spoken through the prophet. But again, the blatant disregard for the word of God in the king's heart sort of hangs heavy over our day and time as well, doesn't it? Uh, people rejecting the words of God. But today, kings don't have to burn the words. We have more copies than we can count. I actually was reading a, a Facebook post from a pastor, in a, and he was asking how to dispose of, of used Bibles. 
And I was reading through the comments because I knew there'd be lots of different opinions about how to dispose of, of used Bibles. And, and, uh, and ultimately, we've got more copies than we know what to do with. I mean, we, we've got more copies on our shelves than, than we could ever possibly read. We've got digital copies and all kinds of different translations. I mean, we've got more Bible than, than we could ever use in this day and time. So it's not a matter of destroying the Bible today. In fact, all that has to happen today is for a, a king, whoever it is that's in charge, to just parade some unbelieving scholar and some unbelieving academic to the microphone and sow doubt into the culture. Well, did you see this? Did you hear, hear about this archaeological finding? Did you see this, this mysterious finding? Are we sure we can believe what the Bible says? Are we sure we can trust what this book says? And we just see again and again and again the enemies of God sowing doubt into the authority of the Word of God. Jeremiah's 40-year ministry covered some of the darkest days in the history of the nation. And just to help us keep Jeremiah in the context of where it belongs, he wrote in, as contemporary with Ezekiel and Daniel. They shared time together. Their ministries overlapped. It's very likely that, that Jeremiah overlapped with the minor prophets of Joel and Nahum, Habakkuk, and Obadiah. So, so Jeremiah is not in a vacuum. There's other prophetic ministries going on. It was a, it was a rich time of the prophetic work that was happening as God was speaking through these men to try to capture the attention of the nation, but the nation would not hear it. In Jeremiah chapter 1, though, we encounter Jeremiah's calling. All the writing prophets in the Old Testament give us some account of their prophetic call, and Jeremiah is no different. And we get Jeremiah's prophetic calling right here in the very first chapter. And we can take Jeremiah's calling and we can glean some really important things from Jeremiah's calling. For example, one of the things that Jeremiah's calling teaches us, it teaches us that life matters. Jeremiah's calling teaches us that life matters. The very first thing that God says, verse 4, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Isn't it strange that such a statement today could be deemed so controversial? Isn't it strange that such a clear statement of truth could be deemed so controversial in this day and time? And what's interesting is that when they were first penned, these words were not controversial. It was accepted, it was trusted, it was believed. But today, for a pastor or anyone to stand up and say, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God reminds us in Jeremiah's call that life matters, even though we live in a post-Christian culture that would argue this point vehemently. They would look at us today and say, there's no way that clump of cells has purpose, personhood, or significance. But God doesn't confuse his words here. God speaks with absolute clarity here. God knew what he was doing before baby Jeremiah was being put together inside of his mother. God knew his plans for Jeremiah before Jeremiah was put together. God knew his plans for Jeremiah before his mother even knew that there was a Jeremiah. Over and over again, the Bible affirms the value of unborn life. From Jeremiah's calling here to John the Baptist's worshipful leap inside his mother Elizabeth when she came into the presence of Mary and the unborn Christ. This should not be up for debate. And there is certainly no room for negotiation or compromise in this world today. I do not believe these words were given to Jeremiah to address the abortion industry of ancient Israel. I don't believe that's the context at all. But there's no way that Christians can read these words today and not see a bold condemnation of any institution or government that permits the wanton destruction of unborn life. And any politician, any bureaucrat, any industry, any institution that would say otherwise needs to be called out for spewing those lies. Life matters. Secondly, Jeremiah's calling reminds us that age doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter. He says, he says I'm only a youth. <laughs> I'm too young for this job. 
Do you ever notice how so many of God's picks in the Bible have some sort of immediate obstacle to what God wants them to do? I mean, God taps somebody and the first response is, woo, woo, wrong guy, not me. You picked wrong guy. Moses starts stuttering when God calls him. He says, no, 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 I've got a speech impediment. You can't call me. And, and what happens to Moses? He ends up being this great prophet and leader of the nation. He, he lets Aaron kind of step in as a crutch, but Moses is like, I don't need Aaron to talk. I got this. Moses got a speech impediment. Isaiah was confronted with the glory of God in Isaiah chapter 6, and he didn't say, man, I'm here for this. Sign me up. He says, woe unto me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. Isaiah says, I got a sin issue. I cannot do what you want me to do because I've got a sin problem. David was the youngest son. He wasn't even there for the choosing. He was out in the field watching the sheep, and he was the the youngest son. He didn't belong. Paul was busy killing Christians when God called him. Paul was busy executing the church when Jesus showed up to change his life and wreck his plans. All of God's picks had this incredible obstacle that had to be overcome. Jeremiah's obstacle was his age. Now, to be fair, this is a pretty substantial calling for a teenager. God looks at this young man and says, I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's a big ask, right? I mean, Jeremiah could have just hoped for like a gradual calling, like, Lord, can we try like captain of the debate team at school first and see how that goes? But no, he he goes to Jeremiah and says, I've appointed you as a prophet to the nation. God looks at Jeremiah and says, but don't worry. I'll take good care of you. What you see as an obstacle, Jeremiah, I see as the gateway to a long and faithful ministry. If you're a teenager in the room this morning, you are in the same place that Jeremiah was. We believe that he was somewhere between 13 and 17 years old when he was called. That means that Jeremiah was the equivalent of a college student or of a high school student, a really smart college student. He was the equivalent of a high school student in, his, in our day and time. I would simply ask our, our young people, what are you doing with your life as a follower of Jesus? What are you doing your, with your life as a Christian? Are you listening to the voice of God as he speaks into your life? Some of you may very well be tomorrow's missionaries, ministry leaders, or pastors. And listen to me, you are not too young to hear that calling, even if you still need some guidance on figuring out how to process it. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, speaking to a young pastor, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. God looks at these young people and says, you're not too young to serve me. You're not too young to be set apart to do my work. In fact, you're not too young to even set an example, as Paul said to Timothy. But the reality is that we're seeing fewer and fewer young men and women surrender their lives in that capacity. Our Southern Baptist Seminary has reported that enrollment has dropped over 20% since 2020. Beyond our Southern Baptist seminaries, the Association of Theological Schools reported 57% of their member schools are experiencing a declining enrollment. And again, this is easy to explain. If young people aren't listening to God's call, it shouldn't surprise us to see that our seminaries are shrinking because who goes to seminary? It's the people who are saying yes to that vocational calling. I was 19 years old when the Lord called me. I preached my very first sermon on a Wednesday night prayer meeting right back here in the room where the kids are meeting today. And I'm pretty sure it was an awful, awful, absolutely terrible, awful sermon. But I'll tell you what happened is that God used that first sermon to put a fire in my bones for declaring the Word of God. If you're a teenager, you ought to enjoy being a teenager But don't enjoy it so much that you forget that God still wants to use you. And for some, he may even be calling you in some capacity to serve him in some ministry vocation. You guys are all sitting right there in the balcony. I wish you were right here so I could really make eye contact with you. But age isn't the only obstacle. We use all kinds of excuses to stop from being used. We claim we're too busy. We claim we lack resources. Sometimes we simply refuse to submit to the Lord's rule and reign over our lives. But I love what God said to Jeremiah here. Because God says, I've, I've, I've called you, I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations. 
Jeremiah's like, oh, hold on, Lord. <laughs> Behold, I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. And God said, what? Do not say, I'm only a youth. In the Brian Carroll translation, this is, cut the excuses. Cut the excuses. Do not say, I'm only a youth. Stop the excuses, because God knows what he's doing, and God doesn't make mistakes. Your excuses do not mean that God made a mistake. None of the excuses given by God's servants in the Old Testament were worth a dime. What had happened, though, is Jeremiah had forgotten that God is not limited by human weakness. God himself possesses everything that Jeremiah needed to answer his call. In fact, God tends to have a procedure in his work. He enables weak tools to do strong jobs. That's kind of a hallmark of how God tends to work. His entire workforce is comprised of dubious candidates. But when God calls someone to do a job, he gives him or her all of the gifts needed to do that job. With God's calling come God's, comes God's gifting. But if you're a Christian today, you need to understand you may certainly not be set apart to be a prophet like Jeremiah. You may not be called vocationally as a missionary or a pastor or some other capacity, but God has a plan and a desire for your life as well. Jesus said in John 15, 16, you did not chose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Jeremiah was appointed as a prophet to the nations, but all of us have been appointed to go and bear fruit, good kingdom fruit. And if you don't see that kind of fruit in your life, then you're not doing it right. Thirdly, Jeremiah's call reminds us that the nations matter. He says, Jeremiah, you are a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah's calling was more than just to the nation of Israel and Judah. Jeremiah's calling was greater than that. By the end of the book, Jeremiah's rolling off judgments against all of Israel's neighbors. Like everybody's getting caught up in, in what God has to say about these nations. But what, that, what does that teach us? Not that God wants to destroy the nations, defeat the nations. It reminds us that God cares about the nations. He's not just worried about righteousness in Israel and Judah. He wants righteousness everywhere. He wants a righteous people across the world. We serve a missionary God who cares about the ends of the earth. Jeremiah's prophetic ministry to the nations reminds us of that. At the same time, you can't read through these words and deny that Jesus is present in the book of Jeremiah. In fact, God tells Jeremiah that he has the authority over nations and kingdoms to pluck them up, to break them down, to destroy them, and to overthrow them. But he also says to Jeremiah, you've got the authority to build and to plant. It's not all bad news. It sounds like bad news, but after the bad news is shared, there's good news. Jeremiah, you're going to build and you're going to plant. There's, there's good work to be done. It's not all bad news. There is grace because God has a plan for the nations that involve not their ultimate dismissal, but God has a plan for the nations that every nation, tribe, and tongue would hear the gospel. Jeremiah has this authority because God has this authority. And he speaks in that power as God's mouthpiece to his generation. Ladies and gentlemen, our generation needs to hear from the Lord. And we happen to be the folks who have been given that commission. The same authority that Jeremiah had, but a brand new commission. We are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We are to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. Inasmuch as Jeremiah, Jeremiah's words continue to speak to us, we must continue to proclaim the word of God to the nations. This week, I learned about a report from Oxford University. Students in Oxford conducted a project to rate their local churches based on how safe they were for students who practiced alternative lifestyles. As a part of the project, students visited churches, listened to sermons, even interviewed parishioners to generate a score. If your church scored a one, well, your church wasn't very opening and open and affirming. If you scored a five, well, your church has a more anything-goes approach to these matters. The goal in the 
project was to inspire grassroots groups to begin doing the same thing in other areas, including other countries. There is coming a day where churches are going to be put on a list, and their score is ultimately going to come down to how faithful they are to the Word of God. If you're faithful to the Word of God, you're going to be a one. If you reject the Word of God, you're going to be a five. But the promise from the Lord to this young prophet is a very powerful and profound one. He says, I'll take care of you, I'll be with you, I'll put my words in your mouth. It is hard to face dark, uncertain times without a certain degree of fear and anxiety. In fact, the the quickest way to make me afraid of something is to say, don't be afraid. Because there's clearly something lurking in the shadows that's likely terrifying. It's like when somebody says, Pastor, can we meet and have a meeting and talk about something? Like, I need you to tell me what we're going to talk about. Because you've already planted something in my heart that says this is not going to be a good conversation. If they weren't willing to tell me now, it's not going to be good. If you want me to be afraid, tell me not to be afraid. If you want me to worry, tell me not to worry. Gentlemen, you can try this. I don't advise it. When your wife gets upset, just look her in the eye and tell her to calm down. (laughs) It works like a charm. But the one thing that stands out alongside the don't be afraid is the promise of God's faithfulness. For 40 years, Jeremiah labored in an incredibly rocky, even hostile field. For 40 years, Jeremiah's preaching didn't just land on deaf ears. Did just land in a community of people who didn't care. Sometimes his preaching actually created enemies. For 40 years, Jeremiah watched his world come apart as a result of the sinful rebellion of the nation. But even on the worst days, God's promise to the prophet held true. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. What if our world is coming apart today? We think about what's happening. We have economic crises looming in the background. It's almost discouraging to read the news or listen to the news and, and just know what's... It's like the, the, the clock is ticking. The 60 minutes clock is ticking. And you know the episode's going to be over sooner or later. But you just can't help but think that there are these crises that are looming. You can't help but get the sense that we're living in a military tinderbox either, can you? You look at what's happening around the world, and, and I mean, not to scare us, don't be afraid, but we're one mistake away in Europe from something catastrophic unfolding. Just one mistake, one missile landing in the wrong place, and we're in the middle of something catastrophic. The culture has embraced immoralities to such an extent that we take pride in our depravity rather than shame. I was listening to Tim Ballard give an interview this week. Tim Ballard's a guy that you've probably heard of him. He's involved in the human trafficking and rescuing slaves and rescuing children, things like that. The blockbuster movie this summer, The Sound of Freedom, that was about Tim Ballard. So just some context. I was listening to him give an interview, and he was talking about that on the border where we've got all these immigrant things happening, He said that it's easier for a child trafficker to pick up a kid from the government at the border than it is for you to adopt a cat at your local animal shelter. Want a kid? Go to the border, pick one up. Want a cat? Fill out this paperwork, is essentially what he was saying. And all those kids invariably get turned into slaves with all kinds of immoral and inhumane situations. Ballard said there's more slaves today than there has ever been, even in the height of the transatlantic slave trade, we've got more people enslaved today than we've ever had before. Welcome to 2023. I know we live in a little enclave where we're kind of insulated. We're in the most church community in the world. I mean, we got all these things working for us. But just outside, there's all sorts of things that are happening. There's all sorts of clocks that are ticking. And to be quite honest, The church is floundering in our post-COVID world. 
I sat in a meeting the other day with a group of pastors and discussed the fact that churches across the board have shrunk by 20 to 30 percent from where they were in 2019. 20 to 30 percent. Not, not just this church or that church, most churches. A lot of the churches that are growing the fastest right now are those from charismatic traditions with dubious theological positions. So in all the metrics I can think of, morality, military, economics, religion, all these things, and all of these things that I can think of, it might do us some good to spend some time with the weeping prophet to the nations. Maybe personally you feel like things are coming apart too. Personally, you look at your life and maybe you feel lonely. You feel rejected. You feel like nobody cares. You feel like you've made too many enemies and not enough friends. Well, Jeremiah is a good colleague to you because he knows what that's like. And so a weeping prophet has a word for you too along the way. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for your words. I thank you for the prophet Jeremiah, for the, I thank you for the clarity with which these Old Testament prophets speak. Sometimes we lose the meaning because we get lost in the context and the length, and Lord, sometimes it's hard to keep track of where we are, but if we'll take time and process the words, we see that they still have a lot of relevancy for us today. Father, we acknowledge as we look at the world today, there's a lot of things that are happening there's a lot of things that we see, and God, we know that for everything we see, there's things we don't see. And Lord, we certainly don't dwell in the land of conspiracies. We don't dwell in the land of uncertainties. But just the things that we can know are alarming. Just the things that we can know show us that we live in a world that, for all intents and purposes, seems to be coming apart. In spite of that, Lord, you were faithful you are with us, and you promised to go with us. You told your disciples, and therefore you tell us, you would never leave us or forsake us. And even as the world struggles, God, the Great Commission calls us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it may be that, that in this season of unrest that, God, you are tearing down barriers that would keep us from taking the gospel to places. And maybe in this time, we need to be a new generation of prophets to the nation, not proclaiming condemnation because we believe, God, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so maybe it is that we as a new generation of prophets to the nation need to declare to the nation that there is a God in heaven who sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty for sins that every nation, tribe, and tongue could be represented around the throne. Jeremiah is a prophet to the nations. But we are a people who are called to the nations. May we recognize that in our lives and be sensitive to that in our service to you. Lord, I want to pray particularly for the young people who are here today. God, I know there are some who are struggling with your call on their life. And I pray that the prophet Jeremiah, his willingness to be obedient would be an encouragement to them. There are hard days ahead. And there will be times in ministry that they feel like they don't have a friend under heaven. But God, you are good. And you go with us. And you walk with us, even on the loneliest days. So God, I pray today that the Spirit would call out the called. And that God, you would help us as a church to shepherd and steward those callings and point them in the right direction. God, we love you and we love your word. May it bear fruit in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.